welcome to the nonprofit show. We are so glad that you've chosen to spend your time with us today. Today, our guest is Miriam Dix, and she is the founder CEO at 180 Management Group. And Miriam's here to talk to us about changing the culture of a nonprofit. So stay with us because she's got some really great insights to share. But before we dive into conversation, we want to remind all of you who we are if we have not met yet. Julia Patrick is here, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm so grateful uh, for this platform that you created, Julia, and I'm honored to serve alongside you. Day in, day out, I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group. And I just have to share, I missed you, Julia. It's been a couple of days. I was out, as I call, you know, forest bathing. I, I was in nature, enjoying some, some time of being unplugged, and I missed the show greatly. So I'm excited to be back. Um, and of course, we also want to give a huge shout out of gratitude to our amazing presenting sponsors that allow us to continue these conversations like the one that we're about to have here with Miriam. So a huge shout out of gratitude to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These companies have been with us most since the very beginning, really elevating the conversations that we have with guests um, that we're going to have here with Miriam and uh, as we move into the culture. Hey, we have produced 800 episodes. If we haven't, if we haven't quite reached 800, it is around the bend, but you can well, find all of our platform, our, sorry, all of our channels on uh, many of these platforms. So streaming broadcast, you can find us there podcast platform as well. And the latest and greatest is you can download the app on your smartphone. So just queue up the nonprofit show and a mere few hours after today's conversation with Miriam, you will get a notification that today's episode has been uploaded. So no excuse to miss out, and you can listen to this uh, and to us anytime it fits your schedule. So please do check us out on these uh, various channels. So again, today's guest, really excited to have you, Miriam Dix, again, founder, CEO at 180 Management Group. Welcome to you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. We are excited. I'm even more excited knowing that you're coming from to us from South Carolina. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was a fun little chatter in the green room uh, conversation. But Miriam, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself and then a little bit about what 180 Management uh, Group does before we launch into the conversation. Sure. I am um, what I call the chief uh, fire putter outer. No matter what organization I've worked for, no matter, no matter where I've been, um, just putting out fires and just being that kind of person to bring structure to whatever it is that I'm working on is, is really who I am. Now, outside of that, of course, I'm a mother, I'm a wife. Um, I started 180 Management Group in, I guess it was almost nine years ago, um, and uh, really want to help businesses, organizations um, be able to build and restructure if need be an organization that runs efficiently, that can be managed at the highest level uh, so that we can win. We can all win at mission, right? Achieving mission and vision. And so that was the impetus behind 180 Management Group. And that's what we do as operations consultants, uh, leadership consultants, um, and strategists, is that we really want to make sure that organizations are structured in a way that they can win. Um, but yeah, that's that's the, the long and short of it. And as you know, I think I told you this in the green room, I am on every uh, personality test that I've ever taken. I am 99.99% .99 extrovert. So <laughs> if I get to talk in and you need to like pull me back in, feel free to do that. <laughs> oh my God, well, good company. Yeah, really yeah. good company for that. You know, it, it's really funny because talking about culture, we have a culture of, of that. And uh, sometimes Jared and I have to rope each other in so that our guests get a word in edgewise. So let's start out with this, Miriam, because culture is one of those, I said this in the green room, it's somewhat of a mysterious topic and it seems to change. And mm -hmm. we, we think, oh, that's civil, that's a civil discussion. That shouldn't be part of our internal discussion, but it should be. I mean, mm -hmm. let's start off with how do we define this? So I'm going to give you the very basic definition of culture, right? Culture is shared beliefs, practices, and behaviors. Shared beliefs, practices, and behaviors. I love it. So when I was 
in my 20s, one of my first jobs was to work with a nonprofit organization that provided healthcare services. Mm -hmm. And in that role, it was somewhat of a startup role in that that department was new. But when I was introduced into the organization, there were so many moving parts that, um, that really uh, sort of frustrated me because I didn't know what I didn't know and I didn't know what to do. And there wasn't a lot of um, uh, plans or a lot of plans laid out for me as to how I was going to do this job, right? That I was recently hired for. And I, I basically had to figure it out on my own. And this is not an uncommon story for many folks who work in the nonprofit industry, that you get hired with a title and some ideas about what it is that you're supposed to do in that position. And you just kind of get in there and you have to wing it. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you're winging it in the midst of a fire, right? That's a culture. That's a type of culture that exists in that organization. And in that moment, it helped me to understand that I wanted to go back to school because I was like, there's a better way. There has to be a better way to do this work other than being thrown in the midst of a fire, right? Yeah. But when you think about it in that particular organization, being onboarded, how I was introduced into the, uh, into the organization with, you know, whether it was talking about my benefits or whether it was talking about, you know, as part of my orientation, what the work was going to look like, all of those things were shared practices, right? The belief system, let's talk about belief system. If, if you say, well, this is just how we do it here. If someone says, oh my gosh, this is so crazy, we're all over the place. And someone says, well, this is just how we do it here. That's sort of this belief that we have to work this way because we've never done any way, any other way, right? And then that whole practices piece, right? So you had the belief, the behavior, or excuse me, behavior piece is that we just do what we have to do to make it work. Right. And that's a shared, that's a shared behavior. Yep. Right. So yep. the practice of how we onboard or how we do the work, um, the belief system as to, you know, are we able to change it? No, this is just who we are. And then these, you know, um, these actual uh, behaviors of, you know, this is just what we do. Um, so those things, all of those pieces, behaviors, practices and beliefs, all of that makes culture. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because I feel like in the nonprofit sector, we are always dealing with a problem and you, you introduced yourself. It was so interesting. <laughs> fire put her outer, which I was like, <laughs> I mean, Jared, didn't you, weren't you just like, yeah. Oh that's yeah. What happens in the nonprofit sector? We don't take the time to breathe needless to say, nor to strategize or to recognize mm -hmm. that we need to make a change. And so I'm really intrigued by this because, um, there's a there's this thing in sales that says you know don't call the baby ugly meaning if you're saying to the group we need to change i think a lot of times people get defensive and they're like well we're doing the work of the angels we we don't need to change you know so how do you navigate mm -hmm. this to say it is time for a change how, how do you do well, that yeah. without being negative i guess well i, th I think you really and, and what we do is we um, we identify pain points mm -hmm. Right. Because if there's a cultural shift that needs to take place, there's usually some pain associated with why that should take place. Yeah. Um, there could be high turnover. People don't last long when they're stressed in their work environments. And that's a cultural issue. Um, and so you could have high turnover or it could be that you have low staff morale. You know, um, people don't feel as though they are making any headway in doing the work that they're doing um, because maybe they're constantly changing priorities. Right. We try something and, you know, it's great to try new things, but we have to do it long enough to know if, if it's effective <laughs> before we are on to the next initiative. Um, and so there, there are symptoms that come from having a culture that is um, maybe not as um, productive or as friendly or kind to our staff as it needs to be. And once we identify those pain points and the conversation is different because you're not attacking me, you're helping me. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You know, this is so <clears throat> fascinating to me and I'm hearing a lot of HR in this. And I'm also curious, Miriam, like who is the one at the organization that reaches out to you? Is it, is it the CEO or executive director? Is it a board member? Is it, a, you know, like, like who is the person that says, ah, we need this, you know, like who's the one that raises that? 
most in general, I'm working with a director of operations, a, a COO, um, right. right? Because they're the put the fire putter outers and they know right. what fires are there and they know exactly what's going on in their culture. Even if they can't pinpoint it, they know they have a cultural issue. Um, because where we work as an organization is that in that crossroads between culture and operations. Yeah. Because, because we believe that culture is systemic yeah. and it has to be changed systematically, mm -hmm. right? So if you think about systemic, what that means, it's like, uh, and one of the definitions that I really love, you talk about plant life, is that it's absorbed and circulated. That's what systemic means. Wow. It's absorbed and it's circulated throughout the organization. And so if that's happening, you have to identify where in the pockets in the organization, because it could be just pockets, but it could be overarching culture. Where is it that we need to really identify the issues so that we can put something in place that's system systematic, right? So it might be and we're not just talking about HR because it could be something going on with IT. I had an organization I was working with recently on, you know, creating this IT strategy for the organization. They kept saying things like, well, but we're just not tech people. Well, if that's part of what you say all the time, you will not yep. be tech people. So you have to really understand that you have a language barrier there. Yep. <laughs> that's behaviors and beliefs, right? And we have to get beyond, we're not tech people and say, well, what support do you need as an organization to make sure that whatever applications you're using, everyone feels comfortable and confident that they can use those applications well, right? So then we might have that strategy, but then we're going to also have to make sure it's communicated and that we hold people accountable because you can't change culture without having it be systematic, right? So we have to identify where the issue is and then we have to create that strategy and then we have to make sure that we are putting things in place that is communicated well, the strategy that is and what's acceptable behavior and what's not acceptable and then making sure we hold people accountable to that because you cannot have change if you don't have those pieces. Yeah. I'm curious when we talk about change, how long does that take? And on average, right? Because I know that there's, we're, we're talking about a lot, you know, um, <laughs> right. maybe we're just making some tweaks with our culture. Maybe, maybe we're mm -hmm. overhauling our culture. Mm -hmm. What does that transformation timeline look like? Well, you know, there are levels to this. I'm sure. <laughs> right. You know, it, it depends on how toxic the culture is. Okay. Right. So we haven't really talked about toxicity, but if the culture is toxic and the organization finds themselves in sort of this emergency situation, then we're going to have to respond to it in kind, which means we're going to have to make some really strong, you know, decisions um, followed by some really, you know, uh, some implementation of those actions that are, you know, taking place very quickly because we had to stop the bleeding. Yeah. Right. So if you're on fire and you're you, or, or you're, you know, hurt <laughs> and you are gushing blood, then we have to make sure that we can plug you up. And so that's a quicker like, you know, um, those are quicker type situations where you have to just put something in place. But ideally, culture is like trying to turn a ship. Yeah. You don't do that quickly. Yeah. We can put out a fire, but that's more like putting a Band-Aid on a cultural issue. So if you're going to turn a ship, you got to do it slowly because you want to make sure everyone is making that shift together. Because again, culture is shared beliefs, beliefs, practices, and behaviors. Well, if it's not shared, it's not culture. That's right. So right. if you leave people behind, they won't be able to, to take part in this cultural shift and it won't take effect. So I love what you're saying, because I can see this in so many ways. And you're painting a picture for me um, that's that's very distinct. And I've got to ask you, can you take on more than one shift? So I loved mm. it. You said and or an organization said, well, we're just not tech people. You know, <laughs> and, and it's like, well, you got to become tech people. <laughs> we talk about <laughs> that a lot in the, in the nonprofit sector. Jared uh -huh. and I, we were on this all the time. Mm -hmm. And then let's say um, you have within that same organization, yeah, we're not good with playing or collaborating with the other departments. Mm -hmm. Can you take both of those cultural shifts that are needed and, and, and make those changes at the same time? Or do you need to plod along and take care of one 
before you can take care of the other. I think what's important is to make sure you have an overall game plan, like a strategy. Because when you have that overall understanding of what your organization needs, then you can identify at what point do we introduce certain parts of this change, right? So that's what change management really is all about. It's about making sure that we understand what changes need to be made and then knowing how we're going to deploy those particular changes and those strategies. And so, for example, the organization that we talked about, which, you know, they wanted to overhaul their IT strategy. Well, part of it was making sure that they understood that as part of this, every um, director had a responsibility and a role to play in this. Mm -hmm. And if they have a responsibility and a role because they were overseeing a particular system, then they also had to communicate that to their staff. So we build in communication strategies, right? Because that's a big part of making the change. We also build in the technical pieces, right? So what, you know, if you need other consultants, if you need other support, we need to build that into this process. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that overall strategy and then understanding what the timeline looks like, who needs to be a part of it, when they need to be a part of it, um, and then what is going to be the reporting or the, um, the, the impact, we got to measure the impact of it so that we know that we're plotting along the course the way that we need to within the timeline that's been designed based on that particular uh, need. So it really is systematic again, right? <laughs> because what happens, I think more often than not, is that culture, because of the word culture, can be used so many different ways. Um, everyone has their own idea of what that is. You really should identify what your culture is and your organization. So I have a couple of questions. First mm -hmm. of all, how, how do you identify the culture of your organization? Is this a survey? Is this you know, a, a committee that come, a cultural committee that comes together. And then on, on maybe the same line of that, Miriam, I'm curious who defines or who decides that the place is toxic, right? Because mm -hmm. I feel that I hear mm -hmm. that often mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, is this one person's view? Is it one department's mm -hmm. view or is this our shared culture? Mm -hmm. So those are kind of two so me, questions, but maybe. Yeah. So let me answer the first question, which is how do you define your culture? Uh -huh. How do you determine what your culture is? Um, I would all, I would recommend that any organization who does not know, bring someone else in <laughs> to help them define their culture. Right. Because you don't know what you don't know and you can't see things that yeah. may be hidden. Yeah, that someone else can pick up it. on, right? Mm -hmm. So you you should all, I think you should bring someone in to help you assess your culture. Now, what we do at 180 Management Group is we have our own cultural assessment called the groundwork. Okay. And the groundwork is really understanding three facets of culture, how people work together, how people perform their jobs, their work, and how work is um, reported so that it's a part of strategic planning, mm -hmm. right? So, and we need to know if you spin your wheels a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because that's a part of culture. And so and we do that, you know, through um, a detailed assessment, if you will. And we also do interviews like a, a employee survey and interviews, three parts to it, a detailed assessment, employee survey and okay. interviews with key staff members who are responsible for building or managing certain aspects of culture. Mm -hmm. And we take that information and we have developed uh, what we call the nine um uh, seven, excuse me, seven archetypes of culture. So we, if you've ever taken Myers-Briggs and I've taken Myers-Briggs or any of the other personality assessments, we have our own personality assessment for organizations. And so we, we can take that information and put it into, you know, it'll pop out a, uh, we'll put it into an algorithm and it'll give us sort of this understanding of this type of culture that exists in an organization. And from there, we will design strategies, you know, surrounding how it is that we can shift culture for the organization. But any, any consultant, um, we are, again, sort of boutique in that regard because we're an operations consulting firm, but consultants should be able to assess um, an organization's culture and provide some strategies and solutions to help make that shift. All right. So who decides then whether something is toxic? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Who, who's the one that can say, like, I'm going to label this entire place a toxic workplace? Yeah. I will say that if one person says it, <laughs> then there's probably some truth to it. Yeah. Wow. 
I also feel like but, it spreads like wildfire, you know? It, exactly. Because if one person says it and someone's on their side, then it is going to spread like wildfire. Right. They're going to say, How, yes, it is. And then it just. Right. Kind of- However, who needs to believe it? That's different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who um, says it is one thing, but who needs to believe it? And whoever the head person is in that organization needs to believe it because they are the ones who champion change. Okay. Mm-hmm. If the person at the helm does not believe that the organization needs any kind of cultural change, it will not happen. Right. There has to be buy-in at the highest level. So mm-hmm. let's get on to that because I think that that is magical. I loved Jarrett's question. Like who hires you, who brings this on? Um, because doing that is one heavy lift, but then actually making these transformational changes is another. And mm-hmm. so talk to us about that. How do we take these steps in, in making um, a change? Well, the first part is the assessment, right? Understanding more about your organization and where you have opportunity to create um, a better culture whatever that means to your organization, right? Because your data is going to show certain things. Like I said before, there are always symptoms to poor culture. So if we are able to identify what those symptoms are and we recognize that those are symptoms of culture, uh, the need for cultural transformation, and we you know, um, believe that we should move forward <laughs> in transforming the culture, that's half the battle, right? right? <laughs> that is just half the battle. So then... After that happens, then it's okay. Well, now that we know, we've done this sort of situational assessment. We understand that our culture is not where it, where it needs to be. What we need to have some visioning, right? What is our future state? What is that going to look like for our organization? We know what our current state is, but what is our future state? What is our desire for this organization? And between your current state and your future state is where the work is. Mm-hmm. Then you can come up with a strategy that says, okay, we want to be able to do X, Y, and Z by this time, because this is where we want to be at X point in time in future. Right. And so that helps break it down to the point where it's not so, um, uh, like we said, heady, it's not so, uh, uh, ethereal. It's very practical at that point. Here are steps that we need to take to get from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. And so, At that point, when you have those steps outlined, then it's a matter of aligning people, aligning processes, and aligning your strategy to make sure those steps occur. I hope that's pretty clear because I I want it to be practical, that we aren't just, we aren't just, you know, coming up with, oh, I just think it should be like this today. No, 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 no. We should have some data. There should be some symptoms. There should be something that by the end of this transformation, we know we've made a transformation because we can see the data change. Maybe it's employee satisfaction is increased. Maybe it's your turnover rate has decreased. Right. Maybe it's that you were able to finish a project that's been outstanding for like, you know, 18 months. <laughs> right. I love those, those data points. And all along the way, Miriam, you are communicating this with all the team members. Is mm-hmm. that right? Like that's right. You're talking all staff, right? And and it's sort of a need to know situation here, right? Because some things as, as management, as leaders, we know that everyone isn't ready to, um, absorb. (laughs) And so we have to be careful about what it is that we tell people just because we don't want to give too much too soon because people can be overwhelmed, right? That's what we're leaders because we're ahead. We're not that, not that we're better. It's just that we're in front of some things that maybe others who follow us are not in front of. And so we just have to be very careful to make sure that we don't overwhelm staff with so much information that they're not ready to handle. So communication, the communication strategy should be in place to let folks know what they need to know, when they need to know it. Um, And really it should be like more of a scorecard or something like that. So they know they're winning. (laughs) You know, we don't have a lot of time left, but it seems to me um, that you are engaging everybody in the the notion that, hey, we need to make a change and guess what? You're part of it. Yes. As opposed to just from top down, this is our new culture. Now believe it, right? Right. Is that true? I mean, you're... Not- so even as part of the assessment itself, okay, that that everyone knows in the very beginning, hey, we want to make some change in our organization and you're going to be a part of it. We want to get your feedback. 
Yeah. So if someone's going to reach out to you, we're going to have this assessment done. We're going to, you know, do this employee survey. We really want to know how you feel about the organization, mm -hmm. but you can't just stop there. You can't just say, well, we, we took a, a survey and no one told us what the results were. Like, right. <laughs> right? That's and what happens. happens. Right. It, it so you have to, a lot. so you have to circle back around and say, okay, this is what came out of that survey. Mm -hmm. And we're going to engage X, Y, and Z to make sure that we continue this conversation, we continue this process because we're invested in transformational change mm -hmm. or, or, or cultural transformation. And so at that point, you should be giving, you know, um, uh, some sort of time, create some sort of timeline where you can give feedback about where you are in the process along the way. So it's not just that we heard from you, you know, uh, last year that we were going to have this whole cultural transformation. And then it's two years later, and we don't know whatever happened to that survey we took because we never heard anything back from it. So there should be that communication, again, communication that leads to accountability, because we're not going to just tell you something, give you information that you don't have any responsibility to uphold. All right. <laughs> so, one last question, and I've got to ask this because we, you work with it, Jarrett works with it, I work with it. High level, high um, extroverted, high powered executives who I would imagine sometimes this is some pretty strong medicine, or if not bitter. Somebody comes and tells them something and they're not happy or they don't want to embrace mm -hmm. this news. How do we navigate change when leadership is like, well, that's not us, that's not true? How do we, how do we get them to see the reality of this? You know, that's, that is a, a challenge. Um, I don't know that I have a really good answer for that. I will say that until that leader experiences enough pain, mm -hmm. they're not going to make a change. If they're okay with the status quo and it doesn't have an impact on them that, you know, that, uh, makes them want to, you know, change the organization or change the culture or be a champion, a change champion, you're just not going to get anywhere. Yeah. And so there has to be enough pain there, enough loss. Um, <laughs> and that's where I've seen that transformation in that leader occur when they realize, you know what, this isn't working. Yeah, that truth serum, you know, and I think, I working. think uh, mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, it, it's how much pain will that person or persons endure, but also like the surrounding leaders saying, Hey, I really think like to champion, you know, the assessment to champion the conversation to say, Hey, you know, I, I think we could benefit from this. It's not going to hurt us mm -hmm. to identify mm -hmm. some of these baseline, you know, notions, and then let's take it from there. So, well, and that's I relational. Yes. So that, 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 that leader has to have a team that they trust. Yeah. Yes. And if they trust their team, then that team can bring it to them and say, this is where we need to be. Yeah. And I don't really see that a lot um, when it comes to not having a good team around mm -hmm. that can influence the decision of that senior leader. Right. Where I do see it happen most often where the denial is, is when it's a founder. Yes. Uh, yes. Founder. <laughs> Hey, you know, Miriam, Miriam, you've been a champion uh, on the nonprofit show today, and we've, we've talked a lot about having champions. You've been ours. Miriam Dix, founder, CEO of 180 Management Group, 180managementgroup.com. Check them out. Really interesting conversation. I feel like as the pandemic winds down, this is going to be that moment in our sector for 1.8 million nonprofits registered in this country to maybe oh, wow. start looking at these things and saying, okay, what are the lessons learned? What's our culture? How do we move forward? And so this has been an exquisite conversation. Um, I, I suspect we'll be reaching out to get you back on because <laughs> yeah. it's been really, really cool. Really cool. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, been joined today by Jared R. Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself. We have so much gratitude for our champions, and they include Bloom, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out and help us bring great minds in our sector like we have today with Miriam Dix. Thank you so much, Miriam. I really loved what you had to say and i just see that um it's an enlightened path forward for so many of us so thank you thank you so much for having me
All right. Every day as we end the, ep the uh, each episode of the nonprofit show, we like to share our mantra and that it goes like this. Stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thank you, ladies.